Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Wayne Dunning. Wayne's a retired U.S. Army colonel, the founder of OLGS, and also a uh, former chemical engineer. Wayne, welcome to the pod. Thanks. Thanks for coming in. It's uh, been wanting to do this for a while. So I guess we talked a little bit beforehand about, you know, sort of where to focus this, and there's a few directions we could go. I guess what I'm really interested in is um, just because I know nothing about it. Uh, like, what does it take to become a colonel in the army, and, and what does that job actually entail? Yeah, well, it's uh, it's one of those longevity type things, right? You've been <laughs> around long enough. I guess uh, you know, eventually you you uh, you know you get there. Uh, I think you know myself uh, looking back, you know, on a career, but reserve and active. Uh, I think, you know, and this is true of most, uh, most senior officers that I've talked to, you know, colonels and generals uh, of various ranks. Uh, most of the time you don't set out, you know, like I didn't, I didn't join the army with the intention of being a colonel. I never thought I was going to stay in the army for that length of time. <laughs> you know, it was, was going to be, you know, uh, you know, something just to get started in life with, you know, and do my duty. Uh, you know, I never envisioned anything more than, you know, a few years, you know, I never pictured myself 30 years, 30 some years later, still being in the army. Wow. Well, you know, it was, uh, you know, so I think that most people are like that. Right. So, I mean, you don't set out planning to, to get to that certain point. It just, you know, it, it evolves and, and, uh, you know, there's, there's things that, that, you know, gain your interest, I guess, along the way that you want, you know, that you want to aspire to, you know, uh, yeah, I can't speak for everybody, but, but the, you know, getting the rank, it wasn't so much of, you know, just walking around with a different rank on, you know, yeah. uh, and getting promoted for the sake of getting promoted. It's usually there was something that you wanted to do, you know, that was linked to that, you know? So, so, uh, you know, being a captain, you know, the, the, uh, the big assignment that, that most captains, uh, aspire to is to be a company commander. So that's, that's, you know, the, the first step beyond your, your very basic uh, entry level positions in the army. And then, you know, there's, there's, you know, you, there's go on, you know, go on and on and on from there, you know, different uh, jobs that you can do as a major, maybe there's a functional assignment that you like that's, uh, uh, that involves, you know, being at a, a more senior position, you know, uh, and the, there's battalion command, brigade command, and 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 on up, you know, from there. So, um, so anyway, so yeah, it's it's uh, you know it's something that evolves, uh, and I think the for me also was just the camaraderie and and the working with the the you know the the other soldiers and just feeling like you were a part of something important. Uh, I didn't feel that way all the time uh, over the course of that that, uh, you know, my, my 30 some years, uh, but, uh, but for a good bit of it, I did, I, I'd say, you know, there Incredible. was a few years where I was just hanging around. Uh, I didn't really like what I was doing. Uh, and you know, I was so close to having 20 years for retirement that, you know, I stuck it out, you know, so that, so I didn't, you know, I didn't <laughs> love every minute by any means. Uh, and, uh, you know, then I think after September 11th, that certainly changed everything, you know, and that, uh, that gave me, uh, you know, a very strong purpose and, and felt like I was doing most, you know, anything, any assignment that I had after that, it felt like it was something important to do. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Sometimes more important than others, but, but, uh, you know, and then, and frankly, after, after my first deployment, uh, I guess like in, in most, you know, most veterans, uh, you kind of like it, there's a, uh, there's a period of time where like nothing that you're doing seems important, you know, like you just feel drawn to, you know, after being so engaged, uh, in something, uh, that uh, it takes, a, there's an adjustment period, I guess is a good way to describe it. So even other military assignments that wow. don't involve forward deployments, uh, or direct, you know, involvement, uh, in, uh, you know, what's going on in the world. Uh, you know, you feel like, well, I'm not really doing anything that's that important, you know, but that said, uh, 
just the fact that I was still in the military doing anything uh, during those times, you know, at least I felt like I was making some contribution uh, that, you know, where, you know, if I wasn't in the army, I would not be, you know, doing. Uh, so. Is there any of the specific assignments you did that you were able to talk about just to kind of get a grasp on some of the yeah, things that kept you yeah. engaged? Yeah, I was, uh, well, probably the, the most important thing that I did uh, in my mind uh, uh, certainly was the time that I spent in Iraq. Uh, I was assigned to uh, Central Command Headquarters at that time. I, I, I served there from uh, 02 to 04. Uh, there was a, uh, uh, you know, right after September 11th, of course, I was, you know, uh, you know, I volunteered right away. Uh, didn't, you know, didn't really get assigned to anything until I think I finally got, there was something that I put in for, it was around February of 2002. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, I was mobilized. Probably it took until around late April. Uh, before oh, wow. I actually That's pretty quick. And shook out, and you know, went through the mob station process, and uh, the uh, the orders that I received were very nebulous. They were they 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 didn't really allude to what my job would be or where I was going to go. Interesting. Uh, so it was very it was it was kind of like you know I was a little anxious about it. I mean, not not anxious like I didn't want to go. It was just like just wondering what am I, what am I going to be doing? You know, uh, the uncertainty is a terrifying months, thing. Know, you know, so I got to Fort Benning and there was a group of us, there were probably like 15 of us on the same orders. And uh, they said just, you know, they, and so we thought like, you know, maybe when we got there to Fort Benning to the MOB station that they would tell us where we were going. And they didn't know either. Oh, wow. They just said, we're going to put you on a bus and send you down to uh, McDill Air Force Base. And, you know, you, you'll report into CENTCOM down there and they'll tell you where you're going to go. It's like, okay, so, so we finally got there and, and uh, we all went, you know, different directions, but in terms of the, the places where we were working, but, but uh, initially I was right there in, right there in Tampa at that CENTCOM headquarters. I, I didn't, you know, I didn't even, I figured I was going to be forward deployed somewhere. And, uh, you know, so I worked there in the headquarters uh, for probably five months uh, or so. Uh, doing various things. And, uh, and actually the job that I was sent there to do didn't, didn't pan out. So they're almost like just finding stuff for me to do oh, uh, that's the for worst. the first couple of months, you know, which was okay. You know, again, I felt like, you know, being at CENTCOM headquarters, there was no lack of stuff to do very busy, you know, during that time. Now, now when I first got there, of course, we weren't really, I guess there was a small group of people, very, very secretive uh that was pulled aside that, that was doing some initial iraq planning interesting uh, but when I, when I first got there we you know the main focus was afghanistan you know and, and chasing after osama bin laden you know and, and and you know trying to trying to rid the world of uh al-qaeda you know at that yeah. time uh so uh you no, know, but then things, you know, things started to heat up with the rack and then it became more obvious that, you know, we were, you know, we were doing some serious planning in that regard. And, and there was stuff in the media as well, you know, uh, at that point. And uh, so there was a, uh, there was a planning cell that was being stood up and uh, they were uh, one of the projects that they were working on was uh, the oil infrastructure uh, in Iraq. Interesting. And, uh, and I said, well, since I'm a chemical engineer, you know, I'll, I'll gravitate towards that. And, that makes uh, sense. So that was, you know, so anyway, it was, uh, you know, again, that, so, so that, you know, that turned into, you know, over a year later, you know, uh, that, uh, that was my primary job, uh, was to be an oil analyst and, and provide, you know, technical support, uh, given my background. Uh, and then we, you know, we, we, uh, took all the planning forward to Cutter, uh, and I was part of the forward deployed headquarters, which was Central Command in Cutter. Uh, and then was for, sent further forward on a special mission, uh, 
which I can't say too much about, but it was, uh, you know, it involved uh, uh, cutting off a supply of oil that was going to Syria that was illegal under the oil for food program. And if all the proceeds of that oil were going to, uh, you know, various nefarious activities within Iraq, the, the Saddam Fedayeen and others. Um, so that was an important mission, you know, and that was, uh, uh, you know, certainly the highlight of my military career wow. uh, was to be you know, sent out, you know, to a very forward location and, and working with the, the special operations forces uh, that were in the area. Uh, and uh, so it was a, uh, you know, very fulfilling, rewarding uh, job. I, you know, I, I did what I was supposed to do and then some, you know, so it was one of those awesome. things where I kind of exceeded uh, people's expectations of what you know what the mission was uh very and and with with very little guidance you know they were just nice uh you know hoping that i would get in there and, and figure out what to do you know can kind of think on my feet type thing so uh anyway it all worked out and and uh thankfully nobody got hurt uh wow along the way uh you know so, so we didn't have any casualties or anything uh myself included was lucky <laughs> came back <laughs> live. Glad. Uh, you know, but, uh, and so did everybody else, you know, that was involved in it and, uh, you know, so, so, uh, yeah. So anyway, it's, I, I, uh, it's one of those things know, I wish I could know more about, but I'm not going to ask because I want to respect that. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I usually, I try not to say, you know, I say very little about it. Uh, there's maybe more I could say, but, uh, rather than, uh, take any chances you know no, i understand uh, i mean something i shouldn't say i just usually i just kind of you know uh don't say too much you know yeah. about it. but is there anyway any... it was sort of the highlight of my career and it was one of those things where uh i think it was it was such a unique opportunity because i was uh the person with my capabilities uh not that they were that special uh, but it just happened to be that that's exactly what they needed was somebody with my background um, in chemical engineering. Uh, I was like a perfect fit, you know, not just the chemical engineer, but you know, I had lots of military experience and I had commands. I was an infantry officer. Uh, so I was going forward to an infantry organization. Um, cool. So I knew my way around and knew, you know, uh, knew how to speak the language and, and relate to the people that were there. And, and, uh, and also my, uh, I guess my, my business skills as well. You know, I, I was a fairly, at that time, I got my MBA from Carnegie Mellon in 97. So nice. 2002, it wasn't that. that far from, you know, awesome. from that. But, uh, you know, so I think a lot of that uh, training uh, helped a lot too, because I had to brief a lot of very senior people and, uh, and I got a lot of positive feedback on those presentations that I gave. Uh, and I think it was because I was, I knew, I knew how to talk to the senior people and tell them what was important. You know, uh, the, that's the, the term elevator pitch wasn't yeah. so common back then, you know, uh, now everybody knows what an elevator pitch is, right? Of course. But, the, but that, that notion of being able to boil down, you know, a subject to what's really important because you know most of these senior officers are very busy people you know they don't have time for to listen to somebody go on and on and on about something how much time did you have to convey oh, that kind of information typically 10 15 minutes it's not a lot of less. time uh you know th there were presentations i gave that were you know more like 20 25 you always allow for questions of course you know so Smart. So if you have a half an hour, you really need to talk for no more than, than 20, you know, yeah, and allow that's what I would think. people to ask questions. Right. Uh, and they can ask questions whenever they want to, it's their prerogative. So you know, <laughs> if they, can, they can interrupt you, which is a habit I had whenever I was a brigade commander. Uh, you know, I would just, I would chime in and, and, uh, you know, talk to the people as they were going through their slides. And so their presentations ended up taking, you know, longer than what they thought, but, within the time frame because I would ask them questions like every two minutes. I'd I ask do that too. <clears throat> but, uh, but, but so anyway, so you never know how it's going to go or you get up there and somebody says, Hey, look, I only got 10 minutes. So just give it to me. Right. So even though you're prepared for 20, you, now you got 10, you know, uh, 
but uh but it's but you never have an hour put it that way yeah yeah, that makes sense so so uh you know and, and and so the slides that you prepare have to be impactful they have to you know everyone has to have a lot of meaning to it uh and uh and, and you know, so anyway, so those you know those skills came in, in handy as well. Uh, like I said, uh, just in dealing with a lot of the senior officers. Do you practice a presentation uh, like that typically, and and like how do you do that? I guess just to kind of get a little bit in your head on that. Uh, I tend to use, uh, uh, you know, I, I I do some visualization. I think is the way that that it works best for me. Like a memory palace and or. I always give a great presentation. So I've, you know, as somebody who might see this and say like, geez, I heard him present something that sucked, you know, <laughs> uh, that's possible, you know, but, but whenever I'm, whenever I'm really comfortable with the subject and, and I, you know, uh, and I believe what I'm, you know, what I'm talking about and, and I'm very, you know, feel confident in the material I'm presenting, uh, that, uh, it usually goes pretty well. Um, uh, but, but I, I don't, I guess a lot of people, they, they tend to, uh, like, they tend to speak to the, like, almost like they're talking to themselves, you know, and rehearse a presentation. Some will even film it, right. And then watch themselves and, and you know, beforehand, uh, I tend to, I tend to just visualize myself doing it well, you know, you don't so even, like you I'm, don't even run through it. You just, so I'm, I'm well, I guess yeah. I do, but it's in my mind. Right. So I'm looking at the slides. And I'm kind of like, so I'm not verbatim, you know, talking. I'm just kind of, uh, you know, I'm just kind of visualizing myself doing it, you know, uh, yeah. if that makes sense, right? So, so. so it's not, I'm not rehearsing the words. I'm almost drawing a picture in my mind of me talking, you know, and, and it going well. This is the other part of it, right? So I'm not, I'm not talking and it sucks. I'm talking and it's being responded to well, right? So it's, so I'm, I'm I'm doing it well, you know, in my head, it's almost like, you know, they, uh, for basketball, like they'll, you know, like imagine yourself just shooting and making free throw after three free throw, right. You're, uh, you don't imagine yourself missing, right. Yeah. You know, you're yourself, sort of setting yourself up for success you know, in a way. And so, uh, you know, anyway, that's a, that's something that's worked for me. That's really cool. I have to run through the whole thing. Like in fact, though, even if I, if I can, you know, wherever, wherever it is, I'm going to give, uh, the talk, you know, if possible, I'll actually go there and, you know, so if it's on a stage, I'll stand on the stage. I'll I do that too. Okay. So I'd like, yes, you know, so I'm, I know the environment that I'm going to be in, you know, uh, that can really affect you. Know, you that I feel like. Visualize it, right. That gives me yeah. a better picture in my head of what, you know, what, what's, what it's going to look like. And, and, uh, so anyway, yeah, but that, that's what works for me. Thank you. No, that's, that's really helpful. And I think maybe some of the people listening, if anybody listens to this, We'll find that interesting. I say that kind of self-deprecating. I mean, I, I think some people like this podcast, but it's technical. I mean, we kind of just jump in the weeds and go pretty deep. And so mm -hmm. it's not for everybody. Uh, but I think the kind of people that have stuck it this far, you know, are going to find that interesting just to get, you know, maybe a tactic they can put in their tool belt. So it's kind mm -hmm. of a fun one. Yeah. So thanks. But anyway, that, so, so going back to, you know, the, I guess the original question, uh, you know, that was, that was certainly, the highlight you know of my career and it, it was something where i felt like everything i had done in my life up to that point was seemed like it was in preparation for that moment cool uh, and uh and uh and the other thing too you know being a, a reservist you know sometimes the uh oftentimes some of the active people they tend to you know kind of look down on you as in you know condescending manner you know because they're you know being active and reserved, they kind of, you know, it's natural that if you're a reservist, you're not doing something every day. Yeah. Makes uh, sense. You know, I have, you know, might not be as, as adept in certain things. Uh, but, uh, you know, but you can, you know, be, but you bring thing, you bring maybe skills to the table that, that, uh, you know, the active people don't, uh, because you've got this life outside of the military that you can bring in, you know, so, so, uh, you know, so if you're looking for more creative people, you know, uh, sometimes that's where you find them is, you know, and uh, in my case, you know, the, the fact that I had worked in a chemical plant made me the perfect person for that job. Uh, there are no people in the army that work in chemical plants, right? <laughs> that there, 
that the army doesn't have any chemical plants. So it was one of those things where, you know, my civilian skill set, uh, in addition to my military training, you know, had a lot to do with, you know, what, what, what my job was, you know, it makes a lot of sense. I don't think they could have found a better uh, person than the enlisted. Yeah. So, so I was able to really make a, you know, active. uniquely make a big contribution to, to that effort, that part of the effort, uh, that had I, had I been a, you know, had I spent a career in the army, I, as, as opposed to that, that, uh, I wouldn't have been able to do that job, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. There was really, like I said, there was nobody in the actual active army that, could do the job that I was doing, you know. Yeah. At that time. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I don't know what that's like from a military perspective, but from a civilian perspective, I know the jobs I'm called on where I feel like I'm valued because my past experience makes me better at the job. I mean, that's more fulfilling. You know, you feel really good being able to come in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah. Maybe you only have to spend ten minutes on something that would take someone else six hours because you already know it. And, you know that. I mean, mm -hmm. you feel worthwhile. You know. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the, you know, the, the case in point with, with, you know, what I was just describing. So that, you know, there was really nobody, you know, whether, no matter how senior they, they were, you know, or whoever they were, there was really nobody that, that, uh, you know, really understood what I was, what I was doing, you know, or, 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 you know, could understand with the, with the level of fidelity, uh, the issues that I was able to explain to them, you know, uh, and, and, you know, and I think that, you know, the one senior officer told me that. So it wasn't, you know, when I gave these presentations, I wasn't trying to, to, you know, show people how smart I was. Uh, I was trying to educate them, you know, yeah. and, and, and explain it to them in terms that were very simple so they could understand it quickly. Uh, and that was where, you know, as I was saying before with my MBA, you know, background, I think that was, that was something that helped me a lot in order to do that, you know. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, gave a, you know, I gave a talk one time on hydrogen uh, sulfide, which is a, uh, a, it can be a deadly poison that's contained in uh, some forms of crude oil. Uh, the, the, what's referred to as sour crude. Uh, and uh, so anyway, it was a potential, you know, potential threat to, uh, you know, to the soldiers if they came upon it. And, and uh, what can you do to mitigate uh, that threat? Right? or how to, you know, how to deal with it or, you know, what it just, un to just to even to understand it. Right. So, so something was kind of a technical thing and a chemical and, you know, uh, you know, I, I got a lot of positive feedback on that. You know, just to get, get kind of technical about it, I guess. It to them, like what's important, you know, why did, why should they care about it? And what is it? And, uh, you know, and, and what are the issues and what, what's the, uh, the level of threat, you know, and, and, and so anyway, able to convey these things again yeah. in like a, a 10 15 minute type you know presentation to a very, very senior people that were kind of nervous about it you know because they didn't know anything about it i'm kind of curious myself poison you know there's a, potentially like a poison gas that's out there you know sure uh and you know, you know so what are the things some of the things you can do if there is a hydrogen sulfide leak and you're you're in an area you know just to kind of well so so it's it's a uh it's a it's a question of concentration uh and and the uh so there's various detectors that that uh, they made available actually to, to to some of the soldiers to uh you know almost like a carbon monoxide type monitor right that, cool. you know if you're uh and uh you know it has an odor to it so you know you can you know oftentimes you can detect it just by by smelling it you know there's something is uh you know not right in the area and uh and the other thing is just to avoid uh, low places because it's oh. heavier than hydrogen sulfide is, is heavier than air, right? Yeah, so you don't want to just crawl into a, you know, crawl into a, a space that's, uh, you know, or even just like jump into a hole or, or something, right? If, if you, if you, you could be think in a pocket. In an area where it's a threat, right? Then you don't want to just, you know, put yourself in a situation where you might, you know, enter a, you know, enter a, an enclosed, you know, or or uh you know a uh like a ditch or something like that yeah right? that's it can the hydrogen sulfide could uh you know rest in so oh uh, anyway just just things like that you know? no it actually really helps illustrate but the, the big point. thing was it wasn't that much of a threat you know so 
And so there was some common sense stuff to do, but it wasn't something that was, uh, 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 you know, that was that big of a threat, you know, or that big of a concern. Uh, it wasn't like, like this poison gas, you know, that was going to just float over the whole country and, and kill everybody, you know, and, and then, and which was, you know, maybe the picture that some people had in their minds of, of what this was, you know, when they, when they saw it and first heard of it. Right. So, so it was a, uh, but that said, it's, it's, it's deadly poison. Uh, I actually had, uh, I worked for Copper's Industries uh, back in the, uh, I guess the early nineties. And uh, we had a, I worked in the plant in West Virginia, but uh, we had a sister plant in Chicago and uh, we had a young, a young guy actually died from uh, hydrogen sulfide poison. Sorry to hear that. Uh, Bond into a tank, you know, and, and it wasn't cleared, wasn't, uh, wasn't uh, tagged out properly and wasn't prepped, you know, before he entered. And, and, but I mean, he was just, you know, the guys that were there said, I mean, he just flopped over and he was dead instantly, you know, just, you know, from that, just poisoned him, you know? So it's, it was nothing to mess around with, you know, or to take lightly either, you know, cause it, you know, that makes sense. It, could, you know, it has to be, a, a pretty high level of concentration for it to be deadly. I can't remember the exact numbers now, but nah, it's all good. I wasn't trying know, to put you on the spot. It's not something that's going to spread over a whole country, you know? Yeah. And, and, you know, uh, so it's, uh, you know, it has to be fairly concentrated before it's really, you know, a threat. That makes sense. So you'd, you'd see it in a chemical unless you're at, process. You know, so it, unless you're actually at an oil facility. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you don't really have to worry about it too much. And then, and it depends on what type of facility. Uh, so, you know, there was a, uh, there was an area that I was uh, working with some people and uh, you know, they, they asked me about that because I guess they'd heard, they, they'd heard the message. Uh, and uh, but I was able to tell them like, it's really no risk. Nice. in your area because it's all you're dealing with all refined oil uh, so there's a process called stabilization where you take uh, sour crude oil and, and remove all the hydrogen sulfide from it nice and, uh, uh, and, and so you know so any refined oil of course is being shipped all over the world you know is not saturated with hydrogen sulfide that's all been removed it makes a lot so, of sense so, you know, so if you're dealing with, you know, areas where there's re refined products, then you don't have to worry about H2S, you know, it's, nice. it's, it's already been removed. Um, so anyway, not to dwell so just too much on it, where, but... you know, where the sources of the sour crude were and where, where there were potential risks and where, where it wasn't, you know, uh, was, uh, you know, good, good information for people. Yeah, for sure. I would want to know that if I was walking into one of those areas. The threats were, you know. Yeah. It's something they needed to worry about or not. Or one less thing to worry, worry about so you can worry focus about, on other right? things. So one less thing is helpful. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, that oh, sorry, sounds... what, what were you asking? No, no, no. Uh, what I said was I was kind of curious or what I'd start to get into is, are there any commercial applications of that? I don't want to fall too far in this, but the show kind of just gets tangential and that's what I like about it. So when you remove hydrogen sulfide from sour crude, can you then sell that into some kind of market or is it pretty much worthless? Yeah, yeah, you, you can you can turn into the uh, sulfuric acid is the most common. Oh, thing, cool. You know, and, you know, that's there's a market for sulfuric acid. I just bought a bunch for work. Yeah, yeah. so it's uh, that's the most common thing that, that's done with it. Um, but yeah, there's, you know, I mean, every well, in, in any distillation process, uh, you know, hopefully you're able to do something with everything. Uh, that's I, I was involved with distillation. That was most of my career uh, in chemical engineering involved working in plants that involved distillation processes. Wow. So that and, makes uh, you really well suited to going into refineries. Yeah. 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 So I understood, you know, the, the oil, uh, you know, oil refining business, I guess. And, and you know, I, I had a, you know, I took some classes in petroleum engineering too at Pitt. And there was, uh, you know, with there was a, uh, there was a sequence, I believe, of five courses uh, that you could take to get a degree in what they called chemical and petroleum engineering. You oh. know, so petroleum 
engineer isn't that far off from a chemical engineer. You know? It makes sense. And I took three of those classes. You know, I didn't really care about being the petroleum engineer part, but I took three of them anyway, just because I thought it was interesting. I did that so, with computer engineering when I was at Pitt just for fun because I thought yeah. it was interesting. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, so I didn't. I wasn't actually a chemical and petroleum engineer, but close enough. You know, at least I understood. You know, some of it. You know, yeah, it makes and, sense to just, me. You know, working in a distillation process for for years, uh, you know, enabled me to, you know, to, to pick it up pretty fast, you know? So what kind of stuff were you doing in that distillation Anyways, process? Well, so that's the thing, right? So, so when you distill something or you're distilling, you're, you're, there's something that you're after, right. And, and there's something that's a byproduct, you know? Yeah. Or lots of byproducts. It seems like lots of byproducts, yeah. right. And so, so those, the numbers of byproducts is a fixed ratio, right? So, so when you distill something, you know, that, that feed material has uh, a certain percentage of every one of the byproducts and the desired product in it, you know? So you can't like say, Hey, you know, we need some more of this, or we need some more of that. If you need you're some gonna more get this of this other stuff that, too, you're going to get more of everything. Right? Yeah. <laughs> you get more of one thing, it's got to, you got to push everything through. Right. So it makes sense. So, you know, that's, that's a tricky business in that regard. Um, uh, and some, you know, some of the byproducts have value. Uh, hopefully, they hopefully everything you can do something with. Yeah. Uh, and and not just have to you know like bury it or burn it or something. You know. Uh, yeah, you would hope. I mean, you know, so so it's it's but it's tricky, right? So ever all these markets are all balanced. You know, if you have, uh, gosh, the you know when I worked for Coppers, uh, for instance, you know there was. Uh, I had a, a, at least 15, if not more, you know, different type byproduct things that came out of, you know, some had, and there was maybe two or three that had fairly high value. Yeah. Uh, of 15. And there were feedstocks for other things with high value. Uh, and, uh, you know, and then some were just, man, you just trying to get rid of this stuff, you know, <laughs> or figure out what you can do with it, you know uh to, to get some value out of it you know uh but again you know if you got an order somebody said hey we need you know we need an extra tank car this month it's like can't help you you know <laughs> if we've got you know we can't uh we're not gonna make you know that much more of everything you know just to give you one tank car of a byproduct that we don't really give a shit give about. people buying you know, stuff that they don't really want just in order to get the thing that they do want and, and make it worth your No, money. well, see, that's the thing. These are all different customers, right? Oh, so yeah. All, <laughs> the people that are buying your main product are not the people that are buying your your byproducts. You know, so say, so, well, so, if, if you want a, some hydrogen sulfide, you get more. Yeah, diesel fuel. So I don't know. You know, but... so it's a big balancing. You know, and of course, a lot of these time, you know, a lot of times these things are liquids, right? So, so you can't just stockpile them in a warehouse. You got to put it in a tank. You know, so when your tanks are full, they're full. That's it. You know. And the whole uh, process stops because you can't. Well, so either that or you put it in a barge, you know, so, so you can use, you know, what's called floating storage, uh, which is very expensive, right? So, so you're paying a lot of money to store stuff in a barge, you know, as opposed to a, a tank. Now, where does that expense so come from? Are those barges rented or is it just having yeah, space? Yeah, in you the lease them. Okay. Wow. Well, you lease them and then, you know, then you have to pay for all the, you know, the, the, you know, there's, there's a lot involved with barges, right. That That's not involved with a tank. That's just, you know, um, then you've got this, you know, uh, well, you know, it's, 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 it's a potential hazard, right. Anytime, that anytime you've got floating, you know, you've got a chemical that's floating around, uh, out in the river somewhere. It's a lot, you know, there's a lot, a lot of things that can go wrong. They can't go wrong if it's in a tank, you know, sitting up in the, yeah, it makes you know, sense. You know, yeah, right so if that gets so, yeah, you're leaking out imagine issues. the epa would be all over you <laughs> yeah yeah so so uh you know and barges sometimes barges are hard to come by you know that that whole business is uh it's not like uh you know it's not like federal express where you know you say like hey i want a barge and then the, you know later on that day it shows up you know sometimes these things take weeks you know yeah it makes sense to get lined up and get the barges where you need them to be and and so yeah it's a you know it can be tricky sometimes you know yeah but i guess so so you know so that said right if there's uh 
you know, if there's some worthless byproduct and you've got nowhere to put it and there's no barges available and you have to cut back on everything, you know, because just for lack of a place to dump some byproduct, you know, you you can't just spill it out on the ground. Right. (laughs) So (laughs) makes sense. Or dump it in the river, you know? (laughs) Uh, So, you know, yeah. So it's a, you know, it's interesting, I guess. Yeah, no, it's really interesting. I never really thought about that aspect of it. So that's yeah. just from a yeah. logistics perspective, I feel like there's a lot to figure right. out. And yeah. maybe even if you're making exactly. a loss on something that's you don't want, at least you're disposing of it and you're freeing up space. Exactly. Right. So even if you're paying somebody to take something off your hands, you yeah. know, that's better than shutting down your whole plant, you know. I was moving in a CNC machine the other day and one of the riggers was telling me a story about having I think it was 200 gallons of coolant inside some big machine they moved and they couldn't get rid of it. Like people wanted thousands of dollars to take the stuff off their hands because it's corrosive and you know not so good for you. And um, it was all used up. So it wasn't really of use to any machine shops. And, um, you know, finally they found somebody willing to take it. You know, they, apparently they just didn't ask any questions. <laughs> they just got rid of it the second, you know, they found anybody that wanted it. So yeah it's interesting yeah. I think about that every yeah. day but anyway so that's uh you know that's a uh for the chemical industry you know for for you know certain products of course that's a uh that can be a tricky business uh is when with distillation in particular you know uh is trying to balance trying to balance out all your products you know yeah i can i can only imagine i mean i have some family that are executives in chemical enterprises and it's given me like a little more insight to some of the stuff they must have to deal with, you know, just the challenges there. Yeah. Yeah. Now other, you know, other, other, other types of chemical processes, you know, you, you may, you may not have the, the issue of byproducts so much, you know, the, the things like where you're distilling crude oil or coal tar, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's lots of components in it, you know, tens of thousands of different, you know, organic molecules of wow. various, types, you know, that, and they all got to go somewhere, you know, you find so, a use for tens of thousands of things. Well, I mean, that so, so like say gasoline, right. Yeah. It has, you know, thousands of compounds are in gasoline, right. So they all get lumped together into the gasoline, you know, uh, and, and so on and so forth, you know, uh, road tar and, and, uh, you know, the, the lighter, the lighter gases, of course, are, you know, are, are fairly separate. Uh, like, you know, ethane, butane, okay. propane, yeah. right. Those are, those are maybe a little bit of the others on each side. Of, There's markets uh, for those at least. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Yeah. That's well, you know, that said, uh, you know, this, this, uh, ethane cracker that's being built up in Manaka PA. By, I don't know about this. By Shell. Uh, you know, ethane is really doesn't have a market. That's a good case in point, right? So when you, you're, you're, you know, the Marcellus region, right? You're, you're, you're taking advantage of all the natural gas in the area. And, and, uh, you know, uh, there's stuff that you can do with, with all the byproducts, you know, that come out of the ground. That's part of natural gas, except for ethane. Uh, there's not really a good use for ethane. Uh, and so, uh, and that's what that cracker's there for, is to convert that ethane into into polyethylene. Oh, cool! Uh, Which there's a huge market for. And now there's a, there's lots of stuff you can do with polyethylene, right? Yeah, so, it's in everything. Yeah. So so and there's all different types of polyethylenes, and, and uh, you know, so so anyway, so that's that's a way of taking something that's, you know, a a a useless byproduct the way it is, and it's now potentially a valuable feedstock for yeah. Yeah, you know, make polyethylene. Um, yeah, and in fact, seeing that right, that's that's what's going to drive, uh, you know, the the plastics industry in the United States because that ethane. I mean, you know, of course, whoever's whoever's producing uh, those the the various gases, uh, they're not going to give them away for free. But that yeah. said, there it's it's essentially ethane is just an un it's an unwanted byproduct, essentially. What you're really after is the methane, right? That's what's going into your house is the methane. Yeah, it makes sense. For natural and the propane, of course, there's a big market for propane and butane. Yep. Uh, 
to, to be used as is. Uh, but uh, so people who are making polyethylene from petroleum derived sources, it's far more expensive, you know? This ethane is just coming right out of the ground and it's, it, it has to be uh, produced as part of the, the purification process to get the methane. Yeah, it makes so, sense. So, uh, so there it is, right? So, You've got all this ethane. These people got all this ethane on their hands. And it's one of those uh, things that's just taking up space and, you know, there's now, could there be a yeah. use for it? Cause I mean, I'm not a chemist, but it just by its nature, the name sounds like it's something that's probably highly flammable and combustible. Um, well, yeah. I mean, that's what, basically that's what you do, right? Is if you, if you can't figure out what else to do with it, you have to flare it. That makes sense. Uh, you know, but, but for the quantities that they're producing, there's, you know, you couldn't not really put it in some it. kind of engine or like there's, there's nothing that could burn it. Nah, it. Yeah. This, that's the thing, right? There's nothing that runs on that thing. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, the, the, the world is set up to, to, you know, like the natural gas, what you call natural gas, right? You're kind of set up to run on methane. You're not really set up for something that burns that hot. That makes know? sense. Burn hotter, right? Because it's got, it, it's got an extra carbon, you know, it, it's a bigger molecule, so it's going to burn a little hotter. So it's not really, you know, you'd have to re, you know, so you can't just say like, hey, let's just give these people ethane instead of methane. I'll never know the difference. <laughs> know the difference. <laughs> you know? So when uh, fittings start blowing out or, you know, yeah, so, you know, off the so, so it's just yeah. one of those things, right? So, so there's things, of course, designed to run on propane and, and there's things that are designed to run on butane. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is, you know, keeping those, those higher, uh, molecules, uh, in a liquid state is a little bit easier, right? So that's, so that's the other problem with that thing is it's going to be more flammable than, than propane is right so it just wants to evaporate constantly in a tank it stays liquid you know you ship it around it's not that right that thing's a little more difficult to handle in that in that regard right so yeah it makes sense not that it's impossible i guess you know you could come up with new systems and new ways that just to combust that thing and use it as a fuel uh but again you have to re-engineer the whole world to run on ethane so it's just not really worth it it makes more sense to turn into polyethylene so, yeah. And, and of course there's a big market for polyethylene. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I agree. We just, uh, you know, but anyway, this country, we, you know, we don't, I buy it. So we won't get the polyethylene from the United States. We get it from other people. So it's, uh, you know, there's a big revolution that can occur, you know, with, with, uh, with, with these processes, once they get underway, uh, the cracker plant that's being built in Manaka is only capable of handling last I had roughly 25% of the available ethane coming out of the Marcellus region. So you could build two or three more cracker plants the same size yeah. to handle all the ethane you know, that's coming out of the region. I would think three or four more if you wanted redundancy, but yeah, maybe you're not going to have 100% utilization. So two or three more makes more sense. Yeah. So, you know, um, anyway, it's got a lot of potential, you know. Just that's incredible. Yeah. And with what you were saying about having... All goes well, there's no reason to buy any, there's no reason for any, our country to buy anything made out of plastic <laughs> from anywhere, but the United States. You that's know? pretty cool. We're going to have the cheapest polyethylene in the world, you know? Yeah, that's, that's awesome. It's coming right out of the ground and it's going right into that cracker plant that's, that's in Manaka, you know, or other places along the Ohio river. Uh, so yeah. Interesting. We'll see what happens with that, but it's, potentially revolutionary or I don't, I don't have any inside information about the cracker plant. I don't know when they're going to get underway or, you know, what their schedule is. They, they don't make that, that information public and I don't, you know, so I don't know, but hopefully it's sometime soon. I hope. I mean, I, I recently had a foray into American manufacturing with my new job at Formlogic. I don't know if I ever talked to you about that, but I, uh, now they're director of advanced projects and uh, a lot of what we do is, you know, bringing manufacturing right back here to America and uh, making parts mainly for the aerospace industry. So uh, I don't know, it's, it's a lot of fun. I mean, there's, there's an ITAR requirement that a lot of our clients have, which means they have to have it made in America and you know, the way that we ITAR. operate <laughs> figured, <laughs> but it's, it's more for the listeners because, you know, yeah, yeah. Kinda, gotta define stuff, but um, you know, it's what we've really specialized in is, you know, being able to make, higher precision parts, you know, more effectively with less people, which, you know, I mean, I've 
been a big proponent of automation for a long time. I mean, you know, you met me as a robotics engineer, so it's been kind of fun to do it from that perspective. So, you know, how can we, you know, make ourselves more competitive from a manufacturing sense? So I don't know, when I hear a story like that, it kind of speaks to what I'm, what I'm currently doing and what I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So yeah, so um, I guess, do you want to talk at all about uh, Oral GS or do you do you want to stay away from that for the most part? Oh, no, no, it's, you know, I mean, you know, I can, uh, you know, that's my current project. So we're, I have a partner. We've been working at this for uh, for quite a while now. Uh, I've been the main, I've been the main person involved with it. Uh, the other two people that are part of it, are, they, they have full-time jobs doing things other than this, you know, so I'm the only one who's at this full time. Uh, but, uh, you know, my, my partner and I got started with this at a hackathon that was at Softworks uh, in Tampa, Florida. Uh, it's an organization that supports SOCOM, cool. trying to bring in uh, newer technologies, cutting, try to keep them on the cutting edge. Uh, so they're an organization that interacts with, you know, startups and, and, and academic, you know, people that, uh, have various ideas, you know, they'll throw, they'll throw problems out there that, uh, they're trying to deal with and, and, you know, see, see who's out there that can maybe help them with some of the things that they're, they're facing. And, um, uh, so anyway, they, they run hackathons from time to time and we went to one and we ended up being one of the winning teams, uh, long story short. And, uh, so that gave us some, 15,000 bucks, I guess, was our prize money that gave us to, nice. uh, to, to pursue our ideas some more. And, uh, that was in, gosh, I believe that was in December of 2017. Wow. So it was a little over four years ago now. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've been, I've been at it, you know, either full or semi full time, uh, since then. Cool. Uh, and uh, we formed the company, I guess, the OLGS company. We formed it in March of 2018. Uh, went through a couple of accelerator programs. I guess the biggest thing that happened was we got awarded a, uh, we got a phase one uh, STTR contract nice. with Congrats. Air Force uh, to work on this. And uh, and we made it to phase two. So I've been- Awesome, that's even better. I've been working on the phase two contract for uh, you know a little over a year now. A big, big setback because of COVID. You know, was a yeah, yeah. still wrenching and everything. In uh, you know, this kind of like a fifteen-month timeline, supposedly. You know, that I was going to start in say probably would have started in like April of 2020. Ended up didn't start until really November of 2020, uh, and then uh, you know during 2021 I had uh, some supply chain stuff that just oh everybody did. I was waiting for two motors for three months, you know, I, I got calls water. from buddies at NASA asking for stuff. Yeah. So, Do you know where so, I can find yeah. this chip? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, along the way, you know, it's, uh, it's been kind of a slow going, you know, uh, because of the COVID situation, supply chain stuff, but, uh, we're making progress now, you know, but we're still in the prototyping That's awesome. stage, you know, don't have anything to sell yet or anything approved, you know, for, for sale. Uh, we're, we're hoping to have a, a demonstration prototype, uh, put together, uh, sometime in the very near future. Yeah. And I mean, I've seen some of the stuff I'm kind of pretending to, to not know as much as I do about this, but it's very cool. I mean, it's, yeah. Yeah. I don't know well, if you can say what it is, but it's, it's, I mean, it's, something that, you know, I, I really like, and I'm a fan of is, is all I'll say, yeah, I'm, yeah. you know, if you want that's to a robotic right device, right? So it's, uh, you know, it's cool from that standpoint, it's got a lot of potential. Yeah, for sure. Uh, uh, let's say it's a medical device that has a computer on board. So there's a lot of possibilities for it, yeah. uh, down the road. Um, even, you know, <clears throat> thinking of autonomous and auto automated and autonomous type medical systems, uh, you know, this is a, when I tell people, this is a necessary first step, uh, uh, you know, to develop what I'm developing, you know, if you want to have an autonomous system, eventually, uh, you have to do what I'm doing first, you know, and get what I'm doing to work. And then, you know, uh, 
take it take it to the next level you know with some you know machine learning you know the different techniques like that you know uh i think it's a pretty good i've had i've had uh people that that have a lot of expertise uh in programming give me different types of feedback but in my mind it's a it's a somewhat i wouldn't say it's an easy problem but it's a somewhat straightforward problem uh because it's uh uh the the data that you that it's it's you're able to structure the data very well you know it's not like you've got all this data from all over the place you know since you're dealing with the human body there's certain characteristics that you can measure and most of those things are captured you know in a systematic way uh in uh, different trauma uh databases you know the databases involving trauma yeah uh, i know the university of pittsburgh in particular has gone to great lengths to structure their data. So they've been working on that um, stuff so, for a very long time. Yeah. So, so it's a, and it's a supervised learning type situation too, you know, so it's, you know, you know, what parameters are important and, you know, you're, you're able to tell a system, this is right. This is wrong, you know, very clearly, you know, and a, so it's not a nebulous situation, you know? Cool. Uh, so anyway, I think it's something that's, you know, now, again, this is this is way down the road from what I'm working on now, but it's something that's certainly possible. Yeah, I'd be interested to kind of track that as it goes on. I, I wish we could give a more concrete example of, of what it is, but again, I don't want to push it. You know, just just interested. Well, like people. So it's a, it's an automated tourniquet, right? Okay, so it's cool. A, it's a way of, uh, you know, for for extremity trauma, uh, you know, it's it's a uh, it's a life saving device. Uh, yeah. The, the problem there's there's maybe you know there's three different there's three big value propositions with what I'm doing. Um, so the first one is that uh, most lay people don't you know there might be people you know again if anybody's listened this far, uh, thank you. That, uh, people may may or may not even know what a tourniquet is. You know, so it's, no it's something you tighten down an extremity wound to keep a person from bleeding out. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, so some people may be familiar with that or not, or if they, if they know what the word tourniquet means, they may not know how to put it on somebody, you know, so, so if you think of like an AED, right? So automatic external defibrillator. For, yeah, thank you. you. Know, somebody has sudden cardiac arrest, right? Do you see these signs around for AEDs? Uh, they're most of the ones that are in public venues like that uh, are somewhat intuitive. You know, so you don't really have to know what to do. Uh, well, they'll tell you in a voice, so right? There's a recording. A heart attack, and you're the only one around. You know, you can open up that box, and it'll pretty much guide you along the path that you need to follow to to you know help the person. Right? Yeah. Some of them even talk to you. You open a box, and it starts telling you what to do. Uh, or there's very simple instructions. You know that, that you know, and. and and so anyway, so so you can imagine something like that, the the equivalent of that for extremity trauma, uh, would yeah. be something that would be valuable. So especially, I mean, when you're in that situation and nobody knows how to tighten a tourniquet, I mean, you know, right? A, well, and that's the thing, right? So, so more valuable. Getting the pressure right is the trickiest part. You know, if you if you really kind of you have a vague understanding of what it is you have to do, uh, the thing that takes training and practice is getting the pressure right. Uh, so if you have a device that gets the pressure right for you then, you know, that's, you know, that makes it more effective. So that's the one, uh, you know, the, the one direction we're looking at. And, and by the way, so, so I'm looking at creating versions that are for each operating environment, not like one thing that's going to make everybody happy. Very you know? cool. So there would be one that's designed for that, that environment, you know, or designed for lay people to use, you know, yeah. don't really understand tourniquets and makes it easy for them. Right. There's another audience of people that, uh, like first responders that know what tourniquets are and have been trained on how to employ them, you know, and, and, you know, maybe have some experience in actually doing it once or twice. Uh, so for people like that, uh, an automated tourniquet is still has some value because, uh, you know, there's a, uh, a term the air force uses, it's, it, re it reduces their, it's, it has the potential of reducing their cognitive burden. Right. So if somebody who's, in a you know in a, in a in a situation where they've got a lot going on all at once, uh, maybe they've got ten people to take care of. You know, they, 
a tourniquet, you know, the, the, the rule of thumb with a tourniquet is like, it takes about two minutes to put a tourniquet on somebody. Yeah. Uh, and, and during that two minutes, that's all you're doing is putting a tourniquet on. Yeah. Somebody, makes sense. Right. So if you could put it on, put it on and push a button and it only takes 20 seconds, you know, that's in, in a crisis situation. That's a yeah. That's time. a huge amount of time. I mean, to, you know, you could yeah. be giving somebody so, CPR or going to the next person or doing any number of things. Yeah. And, and oh, by the way, you know, since it's got a computer on board, you know, it can record the time of activation. It can record the location. And nice. Also, you know, it can hook to like your, you know, if you're wearing a Garmin or some other device that you could put on the casualty, you know, it can, it can monitor your blood, you know, your, your heartbeat and, and whatever else you want to monitor, SpO2 and all the stuff that anything you can get, right. Any sensor that you could put on a person, it can collect and then transmit that data. Yeah. Uh, that's incredible. So, uh, so it's, uh, you know, so it's got a lot of potential, you know, in that regard too. Uh, and then I guess the, you know, the last situation is we're, we're actually working on uh, with the Air Force uh, for a version that would go into the ejector seat of a combat aircraft in case oh, cool. the pilot would have reject uh, that they would have this type of a system with them. Uh, <clears throat> and the, uh, the benefit there is that the, uh, it, it helps with self-application. So if you have to put a tourniquet on yourself, yeah, I would it's think a very you're... difficult thing to do. Looks good in the movies. But, <laughs> you know, doing it, doing it for real, you know. Uh, so, uh, you know, Magnum P.I., I watched an episode not too long ago where he, he put a tourniquet on himself, you know, and was still running through the woods. And Yeah, I would imagine like, yeah, that's that, not really feasible. That looks good on TV, right? But it's, you know, in real life, you know, just putting the thing on is, is, you know, the pain involved is, is makes it a very difficult thing to do. So there's not to mention there you're are down in extremity, I mean, cause you've cut off all circulation. I mean, if you weren't already, so to run yeah, the point, what they say is the point of what they call exsanguination is very painful, very high, you know, very, very, very painful to do, you know? And, uh, so, you know, and of course you've got, you've got, you know, an open wound, right? So you know, it's painful enough, right? And now yeah. you're, you're making it worse, right? So, you know, the, the, potentially you could even, I mean, you could even go, go into shock, you know, from, yeah, from, from, makes a lot of sense. And shock. if you go into shock and there's you, nothing you, there you, to keep tight, go into you're going to shock out. before you got the thing on, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, so anyway, the, you know, so, so a device that makes it easier to put one on yourself. That's be, awesome. Uh, Gives you a better chance of surviving, you know. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so, especially so if there's a GPS beacon on just, it or something that can tell people where you are as well. I mean, I'm sure the Jeep, the ejector seat already yeah, has that. Yeah. But. Yeah. No, that that gets a little tricky with the military, but yeah. but yeah, in the civilian world, yeah, you yeah. know, uh, it's something that's. Uh, I mean, you know, so in the military, there's, you know, so there's more proprietary ways of doing that. I guess that makes sense, that way, right? Or the ways that you don't want to necessarily give off your signal. Uh, to everybody and your brother, if you're in enemy territory, you're <laughs> shot down. Right? That makes a lot uh, of sense. So you got to, I mean, it, you know, there's ways of doing it, maybe, but the, you know, it's it's not the it's not the obvious one. You know, you want yeah. the thing to just squat. You know, now if you if we've got a private sector equivalent of that, you know, so like you're on a construction site or you're on an oil on offshore oil rig or you're wherever minimum right? crew yeah. in some re re remote location or even if just a hiker, right? You're out camping by yourself, you know, and you've got this thing. Right that now, would be which, huge. You know, if, if you, if, if you, you took that thing or you needed it, yeah. right, you would want it to broadcasting to the whole world, right? The, like, here I am, and this is the time my tourniquet tripped, and, you know, this is my location, and right? So, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so those are the three big ones, I guess. That, yeah, it makes so, a lot of sense. So there's others. There's other ones that are, you know, uh, Problems and maybe good applications, but uh, but those are the three big ones. Yeah, you got to narrow your focus to, to conquer an objective. So I think that's wise. Yeah. So the first one is the big one. You know, we're, we're you know, tourniquets should be, you know, uh, extremity tra or trauma in particular, you know, of all forms, extremity trauma is a probably the most common uh, type of trauma that occurs. Uh, is uh, you know it's a big problem you know domestically uh, as well as you know in the military the military has done a pretty good job of, of dealing with it uh for for our current type of operations you know the the most recent i guess operations uh but they're looking at a battlefield uh 
a future battlefield, you know, where uh, we could have a lot of casualties real fast, you know, the that lethality of the systems, you know, so you can imagine, you know, a, a big conflict like, you know, US and China or US and Russia. You That'd know, be terrifying. Thousands and, thousands and the, the lethality of the systems we used, if we really unleashed them at one another, you know, the, the number of casualties we would have would just overwhelm our medical capability. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Number, you know, so, you know, if, if that's the type of battle that we're preparing for, which we are, uh, then, uh, uh, you know, we need to have some some automated and autonomous systems that can come to the aid of people, you know, to replace, uh, you know, to, or to, to augment the, the people that we have, because they're just not enough, not enough medical people to go around, you know? Yeah. It makes situation. a lot of sense. Uh, you may be, you know, a person may be unattended for days uh, before somebody can get to them uh, or her, you know, and, and uh, uh, you know, so they've either they've got to be able to take care of themselves or they have to have a device that, that's able to augment them somehow. And whether it's through, you know, when I say augment, augment the people, you know, or augment your capabilities. And there's also the augmented reality, which is a way of enhancing these things. You know? Interesting. So, so you could, you know, maybe a buddy could help you that doesn't necessarily know what to do. But a, and that goes back to the first use case. You kind of show them to do, right? So they've got, they've got a device that's got AR on it and it can almost like I was talking about with the AEDs, right? You yeah. got something that's easy for somebody to use to maybe do a very complex, you know, uh, medical procedure on somebody that's, you know, uh, that makes that possible. Right. So there's all, there's all these possibilities for, for ways of using uh, these types of technologies or so the interest in the military is maybe not, you know, the, not an immediate threat, you know, but a threat that's, you know, that we're preparing for, you know, yeah. Military is kind of killing themselves for preparing for these types of uh, situations. Hopefully they never occur, you know. But if you don't prepare I, and they do occur, then you're as good as screwed. Well, you know, going backwards, you know. Uh, so when I first joined the Army, uh, I probably spent, let's see. Gosh, you know, I, I guess the, uh, the Berlin Wall came down in, what, 91? Sounds about right. So. Yeah, so so I, it was not long after that the Soviet Union collapsed, right? So, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I I got in the army in eighty one, right? So I spent those like ten oh, wow. years worrying about the Soviet Union, you know, and yeah. so we just studied maps of Germany, you know, we we fought that battle over and over again, right? Here comes the Soviet horde, right? They crossed the border, and, and you know we're helping to to defend Europe, you know, but that's what we that's what I did for ten years, you know. That's that incredible. Was, <laughs> we worked on right so and even back then they had some the, pretty the, crazy the, stuff preparing for you know uh preparing for these conflicts that uh hopefully never occur uh you know is, is what that's what helps that's what helps to prevent that from happening i guess right yeah it makes a lot of sense why would you pick on that other guy that's you know got this capability that you just see this you know, just massive conflict that nobody's going to win you know it's just going to be a bunch of people get killed and and uh, you know, so so, why why get involved in something like that, right? So so that's the so that's the idea is the the military is a deterrent force. Not yeah, it seems pretty effective to me. You know, that uh, it's necessarily designed to go fight somebody next week. You know, <laughs> or, or some imminent threat. You know, uh, <clears throat> so you know, counterterrorism of course is more along those lines. But you know, we we had a military that got completely away from that uh that, that these these more conventional you know and bigger threats right we 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 lost focus on those types of things for a long time uh been dealing with afghanistan and iraq so uh yeah, i guess that's so that's the thinking right you're currently in the military is to get back towards that type of a thinking about those types of scenarios and less about the the, the not giving up on counterterrorism, but that makes sense you know, but not making that the focus of the whole military right uh so, so anyway, so so this thing that I'm working on, right, has a has a has a place, you know, in, in that environment. Uh, and again, it's you know, so if you're looking at and so an automated tourniquet that maybe even somebody is wearing, you know, it's part of their uniform. Oh, cool. Yeah. That if they needed a tourniquet, it would automatically trip. There'd be sensors that you're wearing that you know, if you needed various things that 
they would just automatically, you know, kick in or, or something that's even simpler than what I described, right. That's, that, uh, is available. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm also imagining in this future battlefield, you know, like lots of drones, you know, if you're probably you know, army logistics or just, just military logistics period would be much like, you know, like you've got various sizes of Amazon warehouses that are falling <laughs> along and there's, you know, uh, whether they're uh, manned or unmanned vehicles or drones, you know, whether they're ground vehicles or aerial vehicles or, you know, bringing you things as you need them, you know, and maybe there's one of these, like, you know, was it Boston Dynamics that has that the dog? weird looking dog thing, right? Yeah, that spot. You know, looks like <laughs> a dog without a head, you know, yeah. type thing, kind of goofy, you know, kind of like creepy looking. Right? Yeah, so I can't maybe, hear it. <laughs> maybe you got one or two of those that's, you know, you've got a personal pack mule, basically. Yeah. And so you having to carry all your stuff, you've got this personal pack mule or a very short tethered thing that's carrying enough stuff for your squad, you know. So if you need so if you needed a tourniquet, you're maybe you're not wearing it, but you know, this, you can get it quickly. This dog or something is gonna get it to you pretty quick, you know, or if yeah. there's a big battle, maybe there's a drone that will fly over and and drop off two hundred of them, you know, if that's what it takes, right? And yeah. So so a lot of these things will be, you know these types of and, and i'm just talking about tourniquets right this this could be all different types of things you know this is a really um, interesting logistics it could be system you know, to it could envision. be basically on demand you know yeah uh, and uh, uh so that would be certainly more responsive than any type of a human you know type mobile hospital that that would be able to triage and, and take in all these thousands well, not of only hospitals. that but i would think your existing mobile hospital structure could be better supported with supplies i mean if you can get stuff out there that quickly and be more effective well, it's, but it's, the, it's the human part right so yeah. so you, you don't have it so if all these people that are casualties require a doctor there's just not enough doctors to take care of all these people. But if you have a thing that can talk yeah. them through how it works and, and how well, the application. Yeah, so, so the automated, right, the more you can yeah. automate things and, and, and take care of things or make it possible for buddy aid, you know? Yeah. Um, that, that, that's what, you, that's, well, that's what you're going to have to do, you know, because it just, the math doesn't work. You cannot yeah, have a sense. doctor for everybody that's, you know, if you have 20,000 casualties in, in two hours, you don't have 20,000 doctors to take no, care you're not. of <laughs> casualties right now, you know, so there's gotta be, you know, you, you gotta do something different. Right. So, uh, so anyway, so that's the, you know, so that's where I guess, you know, my device fits into the bigger picture of that's really cool, you know, where things go. And, and so, you know, so again, you know, if you want something that's, that is more automated or, you know, involves augmented reality or, you know, very, various things. So you have to do what I'm doing right now first. Right. Because yeah. You can that all that, makes sense. There's levels, you know, you have to get something that works at the push of a button first, you know, and yeah. then figure out how to automate that and add, you know, different capabilities to that platform. Yeah, of course. So, so yeah. Yeah, it's interesting stuff, you know, so that's what I've been up to here the last couple of years. That's awesome. Yeah. I really appreciate you going into that. That's, that's yeah, yeah. hopefully people will find that fascinating because it is, you know, and yeah. It sounds like the insights you've developed through your career kind of ground that in, in reality and in, you know, very real, you know, scenarios that, you know, we'd be, be facing. So mm -hmm. that's, thank you for, for taking the yeah. time to explain that. Yeah. yeah, no, my pleasure. Cool. Is there anything else you want to talk about? Anything you want to plug that's coming up? Uh, no, no. I, yeah. Like I said, this is, uh, I don't really have anything to sell, you know, so there's really no, nothing to plug, you know, we're still in development. Uh, but you know, we're making progress, you know, uh, I've, uh, you know, recently, uh, I'm joining a group in, in Tampa, uh, called the Embark Collective, uh, of some startups and, uh, so I'm optimistic about that process. You know, I've had some, I've had some good and bad, uh, experiences with different types of, you know, accelerators or incubators, whatever you want to call them. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the, the the only really good experience I've had um, so far was the was the group called Mass Challenge. Oh yeah, I like those guys. Yeah, and, and so that was great. You know, they're the ones that helped me get that uh, get connected with the Air Force and get my grant. You know, That's awesome. Done. I got some free help in in writing my grant. That uh, had I not had had that help, I know I, I would not have gotten that grant. You know, yeah, well, the phase was, two is no joke. I mean. 
I, she I was no uh, the, the the mentor that I had for that. You know, had several grants, uh, successful ones before. You know, and she really understood. You know, how to put it together and what to say. And I mean, she edited my grant application. I'll bet you ten times. You know, wow. at least. You know, trying to refine it, refine it, refine it, and get it to you know to, to where it really sounded good and the pictures made sense and you know said like you need a picture of this here you know and so i go find one and, and you know, nice and put it in you know and, and uh so she was very helpful you know and that was that's the only reason i'm still at it you know if i wouldn't have got that grant that would have folded my tent a long time ago yeah so, it makes sense um but no, I mean, a phase two, like you can, you can run for a while on something like that. And I mean, you can yeah. bring in hires. And yeah. And there, there's, you know, we're, we're at the point now where we're, we're making some progress to where we can either we can bring in some private investment or we can, uh, or we can get more government people interested in it. Cool. Uh, it's a, uh, you know, having something it's, it's true of most things, but in the military in particular, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of people say startups, you know, that have ideas for things, yeah. right? And so they, you know, they put together a few slides, you know, and they try to get some kernel to take a look at them, you know, and it's like these kernels, they just don't have the bandwidth to, to look at everybody's bright idea, you know, and tell them whether they think it's good or not. You Did know? you have people trying to show you stuff like that when you were in that position? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, yeah. Uh, you know, there, and uh, so anyway, there was uh you know, so, so having something tangible, right. So a physical prototype that you can show somebody yeah, that demonstrates what you're doing, you know, that makes a big difference. In, yeah. It makes a lot of sense to particular. me. And I think, you know, in a private sector too, but. I have buddy who's a venture capitalist who would show me when we'd have a few drinks, the, the really ridiculous ideas people would pitch to him. Yeah. Which it kind of, I mean, it kind of upset me a little bit because you realize that like, you know, somebody poured their passion into this. And this guy's now, you know, making it into a joke, but it was also kind of funny. So some yeah, of them were just well, kind of so cliche. That's a, you know, the, these, these venture capital people, which I, I'm trying to, I, I kind of shy away from, you know, that makes sense. Uh, but, uh, you know, there, it's a situation where it's like, you know, it, it's like, you know, when you're a startup, it's like, you have, you have a used car, you know, that you put together and, uh, uh, that's these vent, these VCs. That's what they they look at used cars all day, you know. Yeah. Like they, you've got and you don't know, right? I mean, you only know what your car's like. You don't know what the market is. You don't know anything about anybody well, else. The other car. cars they saw that day or that these week or that month deck. or the ones that kind of look right like away. yours. And they're looking for certain things that's in the pitch deck. You know, well, and, I've started so. even. I mean, I'll admit this. I've started to get a little bit jaded having done. I mean, well, you know what I do. Like, I mean, I've. I've probably help like over a hundred startups at this point with different ideas from an engineering perspective. And, um, you know, at a certain point, like, I mean, maybe just cause I'm sort of taking a bit of a break from that right now, I've, I've gotten a little bit jaded when somebody tells me about their startup idea and, you know, I don't want to be this guy, but I'll see sometimes just all the ways it could go wrong or all the mm -hmm. things that, you know, they're missing or, you know, just a bunch of failure modes and, I really hate being this guy, but I'll be like, Hey, you know, you might want to consider this, this, and this, you know, I'd really hate to see you get knocked out of the market. <laughs> and, you know, yeah, well, you know, sometimes it's, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those tough love type things, right. Where sometimes it's, you're really doing the person a favor, you know, thank you. They're, they're wasting their time. You know, if they're barking up the wrong tree and you can see it, you know, or, or maybe even well, if a lot of it's, I've seen somebody do it exactly like they're trying to, yeah. you know, and I've seen how it went wrong and, you know, it's, yeah. or, or, like or even if you can, even if you don't know for sure, but you give them some more things to think about, you know, before they get serious about something. And people do seem grateful when you say that stuff to them. I'm always highly apologetic. I'm just like, Hey, look, I, I don't mean to be doom and gloom over here, but it's just, you might want to consider these different attack vectors on your idea and. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be mean, you know, and they're like, no, no, yeah, that's yeah. incredibly valuable. Thank you. Like, this is awesome. This is really helpful. Yeah. yeah. Can I have another yeah. 15 minutes, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah. So anyway, the, yeah, the, uh, and the other thing is uh, it, it's, you know, with, with the, you know, I'll, uh, I'll not mention them by name, but I've had a lot of bad experiences too with, with some local folks. Um, uh, and they're, you know, they're just, they're, they're, they're most of them are, are mainly, you know, they're interested in themselves, 
they're yeah. not genuinely interested in helping anybody, even though they say they are, right? They're, they're, they're supposed to. I think there. I know some of the people you're talking about. Yeah. You know, you know they're, they're, they're shut as well. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I, I don't think their intentions are in the right place. And, and uh, you know, when, when you look at how much things cost for, for something, uh, it's just not worth it. You know, it's like you're yeah. giving up too much and you're not getting enough in return. I had a guy come to me one time when I was earlier in my career and he offered to mentor me, but he just wasn't really giving any real value in terms of advice. Like it was all kind of stuff you could find on a, on a menu or something, you know, it, was, it wasn't really, no. and, but the guy, wanted, the guy wanted $3,000 a month. He's like, give me, <laughs> give me a check for $3,000 a month and I'll keep mentor. I'm like, I don't need your mentorship, sir. You know, I appreciate it, but you know, I think I'm good. I'm going to walk on getting, this one. Well, you're not getting 3000 bucks a month worth, right? Yeah. So uh, plus I didn't have that so kind yeah. of money. I was, I was broke, you know, well, recent college so, grad. So that's, so, you know, when you give up equity, right. Or, or like a convertible note or things like that, you know, uh, it wouldn't have been worth doing that worth with it. this guy. Yeah. You know, it's not worth it. Uh, and, and you know, what you get in return for what you gave up, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. You know, when, when you, when you really look at it, you know, I've got, I've gotten some help from people. I know, don't get me wrong. You know, there's been some people, some local folks that have given me some, some value, you know, Good. but not a lot, you know, certainly not, not worth paying for, uh, you know, in a lot of cases they're being, they're being paid to help people, you know, so it's not like they're doing you some big favor, you know, no, it's their job making either federal or state money to, to help you, you know, that's what they're, that's what they're giving the money for. So, uh anyway so so it's a uh, i mean that lady sounds awesome at mass challenge that you were talking about yeah yeah, yeah. uh stacy swider is her name actually stacy swider she's part of uh uh I, she has a new role now uh i'm sure she still helps with mass challenge but uh she was at umass lowell and now i think she's doing something else with some type of a venture fund oh cool i feel like a lot of those really good people get get snatched yeah. up into the bigger stuff yeah but anyway she's been she was super helpful and it, it cost me nothing you know that's awesome she said um, basically she got a grant she said you know uh, she got a grant to help people like me yeah but she said like don't feel bad i'm getting paid like i'm getting paid <laughs> right so you know it's all good so that's know? awesome uh and uh uh you know but the 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 ones that have no, it's, in retrospect, you could almost see it. You know, you can almost see the writing on the wall. So, uh, you know, the uh, mass challenge cost you nothing. Very That's hard horrible. to get into. You know, it's not like they get. I think they only accept like eight percent of the applicants. How much? What percent? Eight. Eight. Okay. Yeah, it is yeah. challenging. It's it's so it's not easy. They don't take just anybody, like a massive you know? challenge so to get accepted. You. You know, just the fact that you can say we were a mass challenge company is something, you know, and when you're mass challenge, you're mass challenge for life, you know, so I can still go back oh, cool. there and, and tap into their mentor network or, you know, call the staff for help. And, uh, uh, and it's all free, you know, it's, so they're a nonprofit. They get money from, you know, all types of organizations because they want to be involved in the startup community it makes in sense. Boston, you know? Um, which is the other thing. They're not all just people in Boston. They come from like me, you know, we, they come from all over the country. That's cool. Uh, and, uh, and all different types of projects. It's really interesting. You know, it was, it was a great, it was a great experience. That was in 2019 that I did that. Went through Very the cool. Program. And this Embark Collective is yeah, I remember awesome. visiting you out there and just the, the facility they had was really cool too. Like it oh, yeah. seemed like yeah, an interesting the, group. The and dry then, dock area. Yeah, yeah right down the street from Mass Robotics, if I remember right. right. Mass Robotics is just up the street, yeah. 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 There was also uh, a group called, uh, uh, oh, John, gosh, I can't think of the name of it now exactly. But it was a group that helped veterans uh, in particular. Oh, cool. And uh, so I, I can't remember you know, seeing their stuff, affected, but I can't remember the name either. Yeah, COVID kind of affected their timeline. Uh, actually, won a, I won a small pitch competition that they held. I got 3500 bucks from them. Nice. Uh, but uh, but anyway, so they're, they were building out a space in the same building where Mass Robotics is. And uh, and it was, you know, if, so like say if I returned to that area, certainly I could sit in mass challenge spaces anytime. They'd say like, hey, if you're like in town or whatever, you just need a place to work, come on over, you know. And it's awesome. You can sit here, you know. You've got the printers and connectivity and everything right you need. Uh, 
but the, the, anyway, the, this, uh, this veterans organization has the same thing, you know, so they have like an office that you can actually kind of set up shop in. If you, if you were in Boston, and you wanted to stay there, nice. you know, you can make that your corporate headquarters, get all your mail delivered there. And you know, they'd have a space, a space for you and it's all free. You know? That's awesome. So, yeah. Um, uh, but, uh, this Embark collective, uh, that I'm joining is also a nonprofit. Uh, and, uh, so far they've been, they've already been very helpful. Uh, it's you, you just pay for what you use basically. Uh, so instead of like taking a piece of equity or convertible debt or whatever, it's 150 bucks a month. Oh, cool. Just to have, just to have a seat in the building. Yeah. And, that sounds similar uh, to mass robotics. And then you get all of the, well, then you get all the, the mentor support too, you know? So, so even better than mass robotics, you're getting all the mentorship, all the stuff that comes with that, you know, for 150 bucks a month and you could quit anytime. Right. So it's not like, you know, like, you know, you're gonna have a six month lease. You think like, hey, this isn't working for me or, you know, I'm not getting any help anymore or something for whatever reason, you don't like it. You just quit, you know, like you just, yeah, quit. I don't see why not. It's not paying, you know, and so you're out, you know, so there's really no strings attached. Whereas, convertible debt and these different arrangements where you got to give up equity and things. I'm sure they can get messy too, just with the nitty gritty detail. Like I haven't had to deal with those types of contracts a lot, but I'm sure if you don't write that ironclad the way you want to. Well, it, it was, right? I mean, the people, well, people that signed these agreements. So I went through, you know, I went through and redlined an agreement and had a lot of problems with it, you know? And they told me like, Hey, you know, take the thing and mark it up if you have any questions. Right. Well, then when I marked it up, they're like, well, you know, they didn't want to change it. They're like, well, geez, you know, we got lawyers and we got to pay a lawyer every time we're going to change. And I was like, you know, what did you mean by mark it up? You know, <laughs> that's, that's you know, what this, it means. this is a bunch of crap. You know? Yeah. I'm not getting, you know, but, but people that are kind of naive and they just think, oh, you know, I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll just sign it. Right. You know, it's, yeah. This or, or like, like I'll, I'll just say it, that they can edit it, but I don't really mean it, you know, and, you know, and that, that annoys me, the, you know, you don't get along with the people and, and, uh, you know, they're, they're taking advantage of you. And, you know, six months later, you realize that you made a really bad choice and guess what? You already gave up your equity. So I had a, um, company asked me when I was early on in my consulting career, you know, doing engineering consulting work, asked me to sign an IP assignment agreement, which would have given them right to anything I invent as a consultant which makes no sense at all. I've got plenty of clients that, you know, I owe them the rights to the thing I help them invent, you know, and that's, that's the whole business. It's like, you pay me, I give you intellectual property that's yours forever. That's right. But if I had to sign this IP assignment agreement, it's like you and this other guy, <laughs> you know? it's like, no, I can't sign yeah. that. I can't afford to sign that. No, yeah. yeah. That's, that's completely ludicrous. Yeah. But, uh, but the guy looked at me like what, I had I two guess... heads when I told him that. The thing that I've learned is, you know, is, is uh, you know, these these nonprofits like Mass Challenge and the Sandbar Collective that, that I did some due diligence with. It looks like a great, you know, great organization. Um, you know, they're, uh, you know, if they're nonprofits and they're not taking your equity, uh, you know, they're probably you're, you're you're probably on the right track. You know, yeah, uh, you know, these people that want, you know, the the that, you know, trying to extract parts of your company from you, you know, upfront, you know, I just, so even with one of those, they might negotiate on the back end, but that's once they've formed a relationship. Yeah. You know, see, and, that, and that's where, you know, that's where, you know, I finally got to the point where this, this, uh, you know, a long story that, you know, I, I, I don't want to just sound like I'm whining, right. That just, but you know, maybe just if there's, again, if somebody's still listening and they're interested in startups and maybe looking at these, these accelerators that are out there, just, you know, they're not worth, it, you know, I know if you've seen Silicon Valley, but the line that comes to mind is I own 10%. <laughs> yeah. It's a character yeah. that says that in the show. Yeah. It's so on the nose. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, these, uh, uh, you know, these, these various organizations that just kind of, you know, I, you know, the thing is though, most of the time they probably don't get their, they probably don't get their money's worth. Right. So these startups end up failing and yeah, for sure. You've got, they're taking 8% of nothing, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, whereas the convertible debt, it's like, well, that's debt, right? I mean, it's at some point you got to pay the piper. Right. So, uh, and, and the things that you're getting in exchange for that, there's usually like, this sucks, you know? 
Yeah. So if somebody says, oh, we're going to do this marketing study for you. You know, we'll point you in the right direction. We'll help you market your product. Right. And you get this marketing study. It's a piece of crap. You know, <laughs> some, some, you know, 22 year old kid right out of college wrote it. You know, they, they don't know anything. They don't know anything more about marketing than you do. You know? Yeah. It makes sense. Uh, yeah. I've heard that story before, too. You know, for the, not me. Not yeah, there's a guy that wanted three grand a month for me for, for that kind of advice at one point in my career. So, you know, you can give you know, it to so these things that you say, like, oh, we'll, we'll give you, you know, what we're giving you is worth, you know, way more than what we're taking. Like, <laughs> yeah, right. You know, King's so, ransom. <laughs> you know, so, you know, this, uh, you know, and the other thing that I've learned is, man, it's really easy to sit on the other side of the table. You know, it's, uh, you know, somebody who sits there and critiques or tries to give you, you know, advice. Oh, it's way easier than doing that. I'll say that as somebody who's been in that position. The guy who's trying to do it, you know? Yeah. And so, you know, uh, I think most most of the really experienced entrepreneurs that I spoke with, uh, mainly through Mass Challenge, you know, there were very lot, a lot of very successful people, you know, support that organization uh, that have, you know, been through startups once, twice, three times, uh, and are really, you know, really know what they're talking about they're they're usually very respectful of you too you know like you said you know they're they're not trying to uh you know they don't act like well you know like you know you don't know what you're doing and you know this is you know they're like hey you know and trying to trying to talk to you in a respectful manner you know even I mean, the last thing you want to do because we've all been there you know where you have an idea well, that's the thing right so they, the they they have this appreciation for how hard it is to do what you're doing right yeah and so, you know, so that there's, there's a, maybe like a, a common bond, right. That, that they have with you, you know, where some of these other people that don't like, they've never done this themselves, you know, they just start, you know, uh, you know, like trying to point out, uh, well, basically just to criticize you. Right. So not, not necessarily constructive, just you're, they're being critical, you know, sometimes it's helpful and Sometimes they haven't taken the time to understand what it is you're trying yeah, to do. Yeah, well, and I think for some, that's Before a self-inflation. You, know, you know, like these these advice, you know, especially like me, you know, at this point, yeah. you know, not to sound arrogant, but, you know, I've been doing this for four years, right? So, you know, somebody who's looked at this for 30 seconds and says something is probably not going to tell me something that I haven't already thought of, you know, like several times, right? Or have already kind of, you know, so rather than just jumping in and start criticizing, why don't you take a few, if you're really interested, you know, or you want to help me, you know, invest a little bit of time in understanding what it is I'm trying to do, you know, yeah, uh, and, and where I've been and, and listen to my story first so that you can offer me something that might be, you know, might be worthwhile, you know, makes sense to me. We're real timed, you know, like this, this whole thing of customer discovery I was talking about earlier with, you know, with the military, right? There's only so much of that that you can do without a functional prototype, you know, of some yeah. type, you know, that you can show somebody uh, and, and get them to, uh, to take you seriously, you know, makes uh, sense to me. So, I mean, I've done, I've done like interviews of all types. I went through a, a different program before mass challenge that, that that's like the i core program if you're familiar with the i core i don't think i am i've heard of it i don't know anything about that's it. a university program typically uh where they uh you know they 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 guide you down a path it's like in preparation for getting a grant okay cool so kind of like cmu's like, project olympus yeah well exactly right so there, there's there's a uh there's there's also an i core program you know that's that's tied to you know the 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 uh, some of the stuff that they do, um, cool. and uh, so it's a federal program. But typically, what they say is people who go through the IQ program tend to do better in, in in securing a grant, right? So, so your chances of getting a grant are a lot higher if you go through the I Corps program first, you know, and then makes sense to me. Uh, but a lot of what the I Corps program is is what they call customer discovery, right? So you got to go out and talk to people, you know, the Steve Blank type stuff uh, and so uh you know but again there's only so much that you can do you know without there's there, there's different levels of customer discovery i guess put it that way right so, yeah it makes a lot of sense you know, well i feel like once you've done some you can come up with you know oh, sorry you know, 
I've got other people where I've got a functional prototype and I've got a doctor looking at it and they're giving me feedback, right? That's a whole different level of customer discovery, right? Sure. And, uh, you know, so. When you talk to that one doctor, I'm guessing that informs your next conversation with the doctor. So now you've got a better list of questions. Next to yeah, the well, that's the, the thing, right? So, that, so that's where, you know, so how many of these doctor data points do you need, you know, for, for various things? And how much time do you have, right? So it's like, you know, uh, you know, it's it's not like you've got like you know all this time to go out and talk to all these oh, people. Makes, so it's like analysis, yeah, especially analysis. during COVID, right? So yeah. so you can't just go knocking on doors, you know, during COVID, right? You can't get in, you can't yeah. get into the building, for knock sure. on doors, you know, they don't want you. You like know, stay out, you know, do it by Zoom, you know. Yeah. So how do you, how do you get somebody on a Zoom call that you never met before? You know, challenging. Well, that's it, right? So it's not easy, right? So it's these things are again, it's so it's a hell of a lot easier to sit on the other side of the table. Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure it is. But anyway, so that's you know not to whine too much, but there's no, I didn't feel that way. I mean, I've, I've sat at both sides of the table, and I agree well, with you. I've I've had lots of experiences, good and bad, you know, with with mentors and people who are trying to help you, you know, and and sometimes they're not very helpful at all. Uh, and uh and sometimes they just they they just want something from you and you know so, so yeah. they want too big of a piece of your pie in exchange for what they're able to give you but i feel like even those people you can learn from because they're giving you a good counter example of how to act so there's still a lesson there it's just don't be like that person <laughs> well, yeah i mean if i guess if you run into assholes you know you just say like well dude you know don't be an asshole right it's, yeah uh, but here's another way of being an asshole that didn't occur to me someone could be an asshole in that way. Maybe yeah, I'll watch my own behavior so I don't emulate it. And these stories I'm telling you, there's no lack of assholes involved. <laughs> so, uh, uh, there's plenty of them. You know? Don't disagree. Uh, they're big ones. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, so... so uh, I think uh, the startup community attracts a certain type of arrogance too. Like you get you get a lot of people that that, you know... I don't know if it's the need to feel important or, you know, like the fact that you've accomplished some things and now that's what you're clinging to. But I think for a lot of these people, ego plays a role. And so that's, oh, that's where a lot of that without comes Without a from. doubt. Without yeah. a doubt. These, these, these organizations that want to extract things from you, uh, they've got, there's some big egos involved. You know, oh, for sure. The people who are in charge of these organizations, you know. Or, uh, yeah, I can think they, of three of them off the top of my head. I'm yeah, not going to mention yeah. names. I know two personally, and, and they're both huge assholes yep. uh, that, uh, that I had dealings with, you know, and, and that's been, that's just not my opinion. That's the opinion of lots of other people too. You know? yeah, yeah. In fact, usually is three. there's three uh, now, now that I think about it, you know, we might be uh, thinking of some of the same people. <laughs> I'm sure that we probably are. There might be one that's unique to me that, uh, that, that, uh, but that said, yeah. So these, uh, you know, this, this whole, uh, and this whole thing in Pittsburgh about the startup community. And it's like, well, I mean, some of that is, uh, you know, when you're, when these, these articles that you read about this, uh, you know, sometimes are written by these same organizations, right? They're, <laughs> uh, they're uh, I, I don't know that the, the startup community here is, is anything that's unique. To, to other cities, I think the stuff that's going on is unique. You know, yeah, the, yeah. the robotics and some of the healthcare innovations. Uh, there's some. There's there's a uh, you know. So this, uh, I know you're part of that. Uh, you know the uh, what's it called the Pittsburgh Robotics Network. Is yeah, that, I'm affiliated with the Pittsburgh Robotics yeah. Network. Yeah, so I mean, pe people like that, right? That's that's maybe something that not every city has. Yeah, uh, but I mean. Massachusetts has Mass Robotics, which is well, awesome. That's it, right? So I mean, the Bay Area has Silicon Valley people. Robotics, which I'm not going to comment on. And we have Pittsburgh Robotics there's, Network. There's, uh, uh, you know, so so again, you know, there's. I think there's people who think like the stuff that's going on here is unique. It's not so unique. There, it's going on all over, all over the place. And in fact, you know, and, and everybody I think recognizes that Boston and San Francisco, you know, Silicon Valley, that's where the VCs are, right? So if you need. If you're trying to go get money for something, you know, it, it's not here. I mean, yeah. there's make some money here, but not the big money. The big money's in, you got to go to Boston. Well, a lot of companies will get a seed round in Pittsburgh that I've worked with, and then they'll go to the Bay Area. And that's where they'll raise, you know, way more money. And that's right. And that's their right. idea. Yeah. So, so you can't say that, like, we compare well with Boston. 
We yeah. don't. One, Boston's got a higher commercial robotics output. There's that Brookings study everybody quotes. You know, I mean, there's plenty well, of... Uh, there's and lots and of seeing stuff. it. I mean, just the, the stuff that they're doing at NASA Robotics is... I mean, I, I hate to say it, but more impressive than the stuff we're doing here. Um, well, it is. It know, is. And, you know? so, I mean, they have a dedicated uh, workspace. Pittsburgh Robotics Network doesn't have that, you know? And so, right, right. Uh, there's, there's, I mean, and you could go on and on and on. There's the state of Massachusetts has, you know, Massachusetts is an expensive. I'm more impressed with the robotics scene in Massachusetts than I am in the Bay Area by, by a long shot, if I'm being honest. Yeah, I, I, I can't speak to the Bay Area. I only know, you know, what I saw in Boston. Uh, but, the, the the state of Massachusetts, you know, uh, offers so much, you know, to attract business into the state. You know, it's a, it's an expensive place to live, right? So it's it's not necessarily so. If they don't do something, like Boston would be the last place you go to. It's so expensive to live there. Yeah, know, it makes Boston, sense. Boston versus here, you know, it's like night and day. Uh, For sure, it is. Uh, you know, so so unless so they. But they do. I mean, they, there's all these incentives, all these programs, all this funding and grants and different incentives that the state will give you. You know, uh, that's it's remarkable. You know, none of that's going on here. You know, I think I we're mean, trying, but work. I mean, we're definitely not caught up. No, you know. So I mean, you know, to say things are all that great here, I mean. You know, I'm from Pittsburgh. I like Pittsburgh. Yeah, you know, I love I, Pittsburgh. I mean, it's my Pittsburgh hometown. I was born in McGee sometimes. Hospital. <laughs> but it doesn't mean that, you know, that, that's, you know, that, that we're exclusive. We have an exclusive, you know, uh, you know, deal on anything, you know. Uh, and then, frankly, again, you know, the, the startup, the, the accelerators, incubators, whatever you want to call them. Yeah. Uh, I, I've had no luck, you know, I, not much luck here, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, with these and, and I think you're not doing structured the way, do. you know, these other ones are, you know. Yeah. Uh, the, the, you know, the, so the, you know, so mass challenge in particular, you know, that's a big one. Uh, again, it's a nonprofit. It's supported by all these, these organizations in Boston, you know, a lot of big companies just because they want to, they want to have a foothold on all these good ideas, right? So yeah. there's like, you know, mass challenges, you know, again, it's a, it's a, it's a very difficult program to get into, you know, they don't, they, they accept very few you know, applicants, you know, they get like thousands and thousands of people apply and they only pick uh, like a handful, like 80. Yeah. Know, yeah. It makes sense. thousands. 80 out of a thousand, you know, and, uh, and so the, these, these, so these companies that get picked, you know, uh, these larger companies are very interested, you know, in, in what they're doing and what's going on. And so well, if also you could say, Hey, I got some help from Bosch when I was little, you yeah. know, maybe now that I'm getting bigger, I might talk to Bosch Ventures, you know. And so, you know, Aero Electronics. I don't know if Bosch has a Ventures branch, but I'm assuming they do. <laughs> so. yeah. Well, most companies do, or they, yeah. they, they, they at least have their finger in it somehow, right? And, yeah. Uh, so Aero Electronics was the big one that I got support from and still do. You know, nice. this is, what, three years later. You yeah. Know, I'm and you've told me and showed me some of the stuff they've the done with you. And they, they seem like they're great. Right. Yeah. You know? They don't charge me. There's no no cost, you know. I mean, the only thing they told me was like, "Hey, once you get once you get going, just you know, please buy your parts from Arrow." I'm like, "Okay, that's it. It's effective, you know." So I mean, I get and and really, I mean, I've gotten all kinds of free stuff from them and, and different favors, you know, like talking about chips, right? So I'm building my prototype, and I, you know, I couldn't get uh, these chips that I needed, and uh, I mean, they just they they. I couldn't find them anywhere. And uh, so I called the, uh, I called the folks at Arrow and they got like free customer samples. So not only did I get them, oh, I got cool. them that's awesome. You know? They just gave them to me as a sample, you know, when you couldn't find them as a supply many. chain. Yeah. So I mean, stuff like that. Right. I'm just like, yeah. you know, anytime I'm stuck or, and they've given, they've given me all kinds of the, like free engineering help, you know, that's they, awesome. These, these people helping me are, you know, pretty good engineers and, and yeah so and good electrical engineers are not easy to find these days no no and it's uh, this stuff's all free too you know so anyway this it's great you know that and that's just one you know i mean there's yeah. there's all kinds of different companies and different people have gotten different types of help you know uh it's it's fantastic and it's all for nothing you know i mean it's all for nobody's trying to extract something from you well, it sounds like they are but it's a long-term relationship which is 
Well, well I mean, I mean, really, like, I mean like, what, what are they going to do? I'm just like yeah. a handshake thing, right? I mean, well, yeah, I know, but I mean, if I'm going to buy their parts or not, they don't, then frankly, they don't care. You know, yeah. they're going to, they're going to help me anyway. Right. So it's, yeah. you know, they're, they're never going to get paid back for what they've done for me by me buying their parts. Most likely, you know, yeah. uh, unless I'm, you know, hugely successful, I, I would, I would say if it's, you know, at some point it'd be somebody else buying the parts because they took over my business. You know, now they're doing it instead of me. That's where Arrow's really going to get cash in, <laughs> if, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, but I mean, they really don't expect anything, you know? I guess yeah. Well, that, that's cool. They're not yeah. trying to extract something from me. Right. They're just, they're trying to help me be successful. You know, they, they, they take some credit in that, you know, they, they want me to succeed, you know? Yeah. And, and they, they feel like they've, you know, they're, they're a part of something. So, so there is this, uh, you know, there, there are some genuine people out there. Yeah. Know? No, I mean, I've and been helped out by people like find, that. You know, uh, there's, uh, uh, you know, and then, you know, the, this incubator, I guess, I don't know if you want to call it an incubator. Uh, it's a, uh, but anyway, they, they assist startups. So, so it's, uh, Jeff Vinnick, who's, you know, a billionaire, uh, that owns the Tampa Bay Lightning and you know various cool. other businesses started the whole Water Street development that's going on in Tampa. So he's the one behind this thing, right? And so, you know, he's he's not trying to make money, you know, off of this thing. He's and he his only interest is to see the Tampa community grow. Cool. Um, and uh, you know, so so uh, so that's it. You know, so you got all these people willing to help you and do all this stuff for you and. Uh, and they're just trying to help, you know, they're just trying to be good citizens and they get, they get something out of seeing you do well, you know, and feeling like they were a part of something, you know, that's awesome. So it's, so it's, it's, it's not their ego at all. You know, I mean, that they're putting their ego aside to help you be successful, you know, Yeah. And they take some, and they don't care if they get their name in the paper for that or not. Right. And yeah. they're probably not going to get their name in the paper for that. Right. They yeah. just see like, Hey, you know, I help this person and you know, it's like, you know, if you're walking down the street and you give somebody five bucks, you know, for because they look like they could use some help. You know, if you're not doing that because you're going to get your name in the paper or because of your ego, you're just trying to help somebody else. Right. Because yeah. you can and they need it, you know. And so uh, and I mean, I've, I've had people that sort of took me under their wing in that way that I've been incredibly grateful for where I mean, the things I have accomplished with that support are way greater than the things I would have been able to accomplish without it. Yeah. Lately, I've and, tried to be a little more generous with my time at times, you know, because, you know, I have the luxury of doing it from time to time. Yeah. Well, you know, that's so, uh, you know, I've heard that said before about just people talking about entrepreneurship, right? It's like, go ask, you know, if you need some help with something or whatever, just like, go ask for it, you know, uh, all, all, the, all that somebody could say is no, you know? Yeah, so, exactly. No, I'm, I'm sorry. My plate's a little full right now. I can't, but you know, maybe find yeah. me in three months. I mean, I guess the worst they could say is your idea sucks and I hate you. Yeah. That's improbable. And even if they uh, do, you know, that's, that's an asshole. I just came across a, I wasn't looking for it. I just came across it, uh, a YouTube video with, that Steve Jobs did talking about that very thing, you know, about how he asked people for stuff. And, and most of the time he got it or he got something, you know, uh, he called, uh, he had some, like, he was a young kid. He's like 14 years old and he had, I can't remember exactly what it was, you know, some, something he was interested in. And, uh, he called the president of Hewlett Packard at the oh, time, wow. which, was in, which was in, you know, Palo Alto. He lived in Palo Alto, right? Yeah. In that area. So, so, uh, and the guy picked up the phone. He said like, like that was the old days. Right. So somebody had, yeah. you know. You were at home and, you know, somebody called you and you picked up your phone. Hello. You know, you just found the guy in the, in the white pages. And he's like, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm this kid, I'm 14 years old and I've got, you know, can you, can you tell me how this is made? Right. It's like something like basically asking him to share his IP with some 14 year old kid. <laughs> and he kind of, he, he kind of said, you know, I guess in a long way, you know, a roundabout way, he said, no, you know, but, yeah. uh, but he gave him a job, you know, oh, he, cool. He, kept up the dialogue with him he said you know he gave him like an internship and he gave him all this stuff he says like a dream come true for him you know he got the you know so he still got something out of it and he was like what the hell that's he awesome called, he just picked up the phone and called the guy at his yeah. house. you know his name was in the phone book you know yeah it makes uh, a lot of sense i mean you're never gonna you know hit a shot you don't take right i mean so yeah so i mean the, the guy could have just said hey kid you're bothered you know i'm too busy and you know leave me alone on to the next one <laughs> But, 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 you know, it, so it wouldn't have killed him, right? If yeah, exactly. Right? So what the hell?
they said, you know, and he said exactly what you were just saying. You know, if if there's things that he could do to help somebody else when they ask, they'll try to, you know. Yeah. Uh, as best he can, you know. I mean, it depends upon what they're asking for, right? Yeah, but, of course. You know, if somebody's asking for something, a favor or advice or something, if he can if he can help them, he tries to, you know. Yeah, that's awesome. So, yeah. So I guess there's uh you know, there, there's people out there that will do that. And, and, and most people will, you know, uh, without extracting a pound of flesh from you, you know, <laughs> for sure. So, so, uh, that would be my advice to others is, you know, ask for uh, the help buyer beware, yeah. <laughs> buyer beware and make sure you read the agreement. And, you know, once you give away Always. part of your company, it's gone, you know, and it's, you know, you find out three months later, the person is an asshole. Now an asshole's got part of your company. It's hard to get it back. You know. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Cool. So. Well, I probably should cut it mainly because I really have to use the restroom. <laughs> yeah. But um, this no, is... no, it, yeah, that's uh, anyway. Yeah, this is really fun. Thanks for coming on. Um, I guess uh, I mean I don't know if we have to, but it'd be fun to plug like Aero Electronics Mass Challenge. Uh, if if you want, I can put a link there. If you don't want, I don't have to. Oh yeah, no, hey, gladly, you know. Yeah. Uh, and and Bart Collective also. Bart Collective. Uh, yeah, yeah. Now you could plug all three of those. It would be great. Excellent. They've all been very helpful to me. You know? Wait, say again. I, I guess officially, I'm not going to be part of Embark until first of February. But uh, uh, yeah, but so far so good. I guess put it that way. Well, again, if if. Uh, you know, my first six months are covered by this veterans organization in Florida. So, you know, after six months, if I pay them for a couple of months and I find out, yeah, this isn't really what I thought it was cracked up to be, it's going to cost me 300 bucks. Yeah, that ain't bad. <laughs> so instead of like 8% of my company and I find out, oh, crap, you know, this is, uh, you know, this isn't working out, you know, too late now. Never getting that 8% back. <laughs> That's it. I try to self-destruct the company and start yeah. a new one. I'm seeing. Yeah. yeah. If you stuck around this long and you like what you've heard, please give us a like and smash that subscribe button or smash that like button and give us a subscribe. We're always looking for new and interesting people to have on the show. If you know anyone good, send an email to podcast at ska.solutions or leave a comment below. Thanks again for listening and please come to the next one.